Um, I'm a fast talker. I know we haven't, haven't much time, so hopefully we will be finished in time for a good lunch. So, Manley Hall. Um, he was the last century's most prolific writer on ancient philosophies. He um, wrote 50-odd books, he wrote hundreds of essays, and he made over 8,000 public lectures. He did more to keep the man in America spiritual than anybody else. He only ever charged a dollar to hear him speak, and he made millions. And he was an extraordinary man. And he, I, I did this lecture in California earlier in the year because I wanted to find out more about him. It's only 25 years since he died. And it was, you know, I kept it light and it was a risk and I, it, because I hope to find out loads and loads more. Everybody knows about his secret teachings of all ages. Nobody knows anything about him. And nobody knew that he'd been murdered. So, you know, this is a fishing expedition, really. This light, it's a light talk. So, his, his writings have enthralled, confounded and educated earnest seekers after spiritual truths for nearly a century. He broke to bring mysticism to earth and founded the Philosophical Research Society in California to do just that. Um, he was six foot four, he had blue-grey eyes, and I've killed him. There we are. And he was fabulous. He should have been a film star. But you can see the dynamism, you can see the passion, you can see the personality of the, man, of the, of the young man there. They don't make him like that anymore, really. <laughs> he was charismatic, arrogant, scholarly, deeply intuitive, humorous, deceptive and self-destructive, like we all are. On stage, he seemed bigger than life, seemed channeling those from the great beyond. And off stage, he was meek to the point of being bullied by his wife. He had one hell of a wife. Anybody would have given in under her, I think, really. He was eventually thought to be one of the 12 wise men who control the planet, the greatest sage in America, certainly. He didn't see himself as a scholar, but as a teacher who uh, learns in order to bestow his students with knowledge and insight. The audiences thought that he scrutinized them with his third eye, and he was, beneath his smart blue suit, both man and woman, like the gods he lectured about. It's a very strange thing to have a, pro a, you know, a, a long-lasting rumor about you that you're actually an hermaphrodite. I can't remember that being about anybody else. Um, we'll never know, I guess, because his, his autopsy certainly didn't help. Um, he, as I say, he charged a dollar to hear him speak and he made millions of dollars. He would sit on his throne in the Philosophical Research Centre and stare at the wall at the back of the hall as if he was reading a script that nobody else could see. And then after 40 minutes he'd say, well, that's all folks, and he'd leave the stage. President Harry Truman, actors Bella Lugosi, Gloria Swanson, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut uh, who was on the board of the trustees, and Elvis was a fan. He sent the young Priscilla along to one of the lectures one time, and she was so bored, and she just never went back. Um, Bobby Kennedy was one of the members of it, as was his eventual assassin, Sihan Sihan. Um, John Denver, the country singer, was another very big fan. For all his spirituality, he was ambitious, and it came out most clearly in his monumental book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. He dictated that for four hours a day. It was seven years in the making. It weighed 17 and a half pounds, which is near five kilos. Um, it was 13 inches by 19, and I don't know that in metric. And he cited over 600 sources with 254 illustrations. And over a million copies have been sold so far. And in the last 80 odd years, it's never been out of print. He did develop a deal whereby if he could interest a man, and oh, by the way, he was 28 when he did that. So you lot are slackers. Um, <laughs> He developed a deal whereby if he could interest a man called John Henry Nash, who'd worked as a printer for the Vatican, then H.S. Crocker & Co. in America would publish it. He liked to challenge and was actually still writing the last chapters when the first ones were being printed. It was big and it was beautiful. We've, we've only ever sold one of those first editions and it's sumptuous. If you can lift it, you can read it. It's monster. And the boards are about that thick, but it is truly, truly a beautiful object. Um, 
In, as I say, it's big and beautiful. And William Randolph Hearst, the, uh, the publishing magnate, wrote to say that the only typographical error was that Helena Blavatsky appeared as Helen Blavatsky. And I think she loses a lot by losing that A. She becomes much more mundane, a lot less exotic. Um, the uh, production costs were a staggering $150,000, um, but such was Hall's popularity and marketing skill that it was largely subscribed before the presses rolled. It cost $100 a copy, which in 1929 was a vast amount, so people bought it on higher purchase. They bought it on easy terms. And all of the 1,100 first copies uh, sold out in two impressions very, very quickly. In this volume has been compressed the quintessence of a colossal learning. It is a living human document pulsating with mental and spiritual vibrations of a profound thinker. It takes all knowledge for its province and reduces whole libraries to the compass of a single tome. So wrote Mr. De Jong, the museum curator in San Francisco. Hall believes that if you confront the untrained mind with some symbol or fable, it will construct some confused and meaningless explanation, usually far more complex than the figure warrants and as senseless as a macaw's chatter. Symbols consequently change the meanings to levels of intelligence upon which their interpreter functions. The purpose of symbols is to uncover the limitations of moral, mortal consciousness by continually emphasising the insufficiency of the interpretations placed upon them. Well, that's, you know, 100-year-old theosophical speak really and it basically means that the symbols can only continue to unfold their significance as you become more familiar with them the symbols are if you like divine and handed to us through inspiration and artistic merit our interpretations are only as clever as we are at the time when Hall was asked by a fellow mystic how come he knew so much about the mathematics of Pythagoras than the, and much more than the authorities on the subject, he replied, you're an occult philosopher, you know that it's easier to know things than to know how you, one knows these things. Which I think when a lot of us, when we're asked questions, we know, how we, we, know we know it, but how we got there is a, a bit of a mystery. He had a dreadful start in life. He was born prematurely on the morning of the 18th of March 1901 in Peterborough, Canada. His father was a Welsh dentist and was already living apart from his wife. Mr Hall was d staying in a smart hotel in Peterborough and had an income of $2,400 an annum and he moved away when Manly Hall was three years old and was never heard of again. And that was a year after his mother had taken off for the Alaskan goldfields to work as a chiropractic healer. So she was a tough cookie because she lasted in those um, Alaskan goldfields for 15 years. So the little boy was left in charge of his maternal grandmother and she was all of 45 years old and the widow of a, um, a varnish factory owner. And this redoubtable woman sold up everything and set off to discover America with Manly in tow. And they, she was a fidget and they never stayed anywhere longer than six months. She was constantly on the move, this good soul. When he was four and a half, he entered the States in Chicago as a Canadian immigrant in July 1905. And they saw Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and they, you know, they, they went to the circus, they saw native Indian dancers. And so you know, he had a good time as a kid as well. When he started school and was given books with large print to read from, they confused him because at home he and Granny were reading Victor Hugo. When it came to multiplication tables at school, he was equally unimpressed as at home he was handling most of his grandmother's bank accounts. This helps us to explain very, very early on this kid had a brain and a very strange brain and you know maybe he was autistic and it's, we're all on the autistic spectrum that everybody knows that but it, it we, we can begin to work out that it was more than a photographic memory that he had he had an exceptional mind altogether his grandmother kept boarding houses and had a cabinet of curiosities that she would curate for friends and lodgers and by the time manly was 13 they'd done well and were living just three blocks from the white house when he was 19, his 62-year-old gra -year grandmother died suddenly and he set off to find his mother in California. There'd been a very limited con correspondence between them over the years, but she doesn't seem to have visited even on her way back down from the Alaskan goldfields to California. He got as far as New York where he wandered into the shabby house of a thousand memories where stage magicians bought their tricks, tried them out and boarded their doves and rabbits. There he bumped into Houdini, and it's where David Blaine and David Copperfield and people like that, they still shop there, it still exists. 
Hall engaged in long debates with Houdini and the other magicians over whether miracles could be wrought without stage paraphernalia. They talked invariably, their talk invariably led to Indian fakirs, snake charmers and Native American medicine men. Houdini said the only reason he could perform his feats, that he copied them from Asian jugglers and magicians. He also said he didn't know exactly how they did their tricks, only how to mechanically reproduce their effects. Hall interpreted this as conceding that there were supernatural aspects to such things that Houdini didn't understand. Harry Houdini, as we all know, saw spiritualism as nothing more than mental intoxication resulting from seductive words of con artists. Well... Manly headed west with a head full of dreams and a conviction that Houdini was wrong. Um, and he had a job in Wall Street um, and was doing, you know, a lowly level, but he, with a brain like his, he, he could have, you know, ruled the world, really. Um, but there was a man who worked in that office who was a good and faithful servant of the company for 47 years. He died, and within a month, uh, uh, um, he died, and yet within a month of that man's death, he was never mentioned again. And Hall thought, no, I'm not having that. And he was a young man on the make, and, you know, he decided to make it, but elsewhere. In the 1900s, California was just oil fields, green fields, orange blossom and the pioneering spirit. The West Coast was interested in the new, the East Coast was interested in the established. The, the West Coast had the new thinkers, the Theosophists, the Rosicrucians, Vedantists, Freemasons and fringe Christians who were building up meditation centres, ashrams, temples, occult lodges and churches. As Philip Jenkins in his Mystics and Messiahs, Cults and the New Religions in American History says, some of the new movements contributed to the cultural and economic development of the growing city of LA. In a sense, Hollywood was built on occult foundations and even Alistair Crowley was there for a short while in the 20s. As he moved along one day, Hall saw a phrenologist's booth and asked to have the bumps on his head read. And the poor old man winced and said he could make calculations by measuring the radial length of brain fibres from the pons to the medulla oblongata, but he wouldn't read Manly Hall's bumps. So he'd found his first teacher, a little guy called San Sidney J. Bronson. He was in his 70s, he was a Civil War veteran, he had long hair and a long white beard, no connection. Um, and when Bronson died, when he was 88, he had a copy of the Bhagavad Gita on his chest and the New Testament in his pocket. Uh, he filled Hall's head with good ideas, like sleeping with his head to the north to correspond with the vast currents moving in around the earth. He applied Pythagorean theories about the therapeutic value of music by listening to it in a swimsuit as bare skin likes pleasant sounds. Mr. Bronson had to leave town while Manley took and so for a while, so Manley took over his 600 strong congregation. This is in a tent, more or less, really, um, as he had been assisting Mr. Bronson for a few months, and the dollar ahead came in very handy. A name of a, teach, of a teacher that can't be ignored was Max Heindel and his Rosicrucian Fellowship, which was huge at the time. He preached that Jews and blacks had been placed behind Anglo-Saxons in evolution. So some people still struggle with that. He died in 1920, and that was the year Manley was reunited with his mother. And together they went to Mount Ecclesia, and the widow, widow Heindel was very taken with Manley Hall's interesting sensitivity and intelligence. He called her mother not his own mother, mother, that's uh, the young lad with the widow Heindel. Um, and he called her mother and taught her to play backgammon. She taught him, more usefully, astrology, typesetting, printing and binding. And he also learnt not to write in, with an ink pen because it siphoned off one's vitality. He dictated his, his books thereafter. Mount Ecclesia, the Rosicrucian Temple, was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1995. Los Angeles in 1920 was five times bigger than it had been 20 years ago. It housed the Pacific Fleet, Standard Oil and the Donald Douglas Airplane Production Factory was there as well. Its two lanes roads were being replaced by highways and it had the world's longest and largest water system processing a whole 8 million gallons a day. In the next 10 years it went from a quarter of a million people to over 2 million of which just a third claimed membership of mainstream religious denominations. All the rest, the other two thirds, had interest in Neoplatonism, homespun interpretations of 
Darwin, Freud, Jung, Jung rather, and ill-digested ideas from Japan, China and India. Everything before what 1900 was viewed as stale and terribly dull, everything after it was glorious, profound and true. Manley Hall didn't agree. He knew there were ancient universal truths that couldn't, shouldn't and wouldn't be ignored. He needed to expand his audience and luckily came to the notice of Caroline and Estelle Lloyd, a couple of oil millionairesses, and they financed a, a 38,000 mile world trip um, and, throughout, and, and as a farewell present he was given a cross, oh there he is, that's the young man, um, he was, as I say, he was six foot four and he, he, he was uh, tall and slender, mainly, but he was quite thick round the middle. And somebody famously said that he was a great big avocado of a man. <laughs> so I rather like that. But that his, his, um, there he is. He's wearing the cross that his congregation gave him to kind of keep him safe. And he wore that daily thereafter for the rest of his life. As part of the trip, he found himself in Yokohama just be after the earthquake. And he said, we found a city of half a million people without a single building standing. Pain, sorrow, suffering and misfortune on every hand. His hotel was a shack put together out of empty beer bottles with a cot in it. His rickshaw man asked to stop for a moment to pray where his mother, father, wife and children had died. But he said, I have faith. I believe. I must accept. I cannot question... I believe that those whom I have loved have left here but they are still alive. I believe that they will be born again. I believe that they will live here. I believe there is no end and in this continuance of their lives I have peace. And that was a deep and inspiring lesson from a simple devastated and spiritual man that Hall never forgot. He carried on to Korea, Peking, Burma, India, Egypt and India. No, it, they weren't particularly tourist spots in those days and it was usually the army or the trade that were there. Um, he came to London too, of course, and bought medieval manuscripts from Michael Houghton at the Atlantis Bookshop. So, um, I, I, I couldn't go through my slides last night, so they'll come up in a jumbled order, I'm afraid. So I, don't, I have no idea what the next one is. All right, that's his oil millionairesses, um, mother and daughter. They financed him throughout his life. The daughter was a lesbian but wanted to marry him, uh, so he declined the offer. So, Back in the US, he put on light shows with the Los Angeles Philharmonic with the young, largely forgotten now pianist called Douglas Colin Campbell, or the young Paderewski, as, as he was known. Uh, the late 20s was early years for light shows, and my husband used to run one in the, uh, with his mobile discotheque in the 1970s, and it was thought funky then. Um, but he was always a seeker, he was always a darer, he was always an experimenter, really. Um, on the 28th of April 1930, in California, now that's his cross. <laughs> My nephew put this together for me. He's 28, but he couldn't resist mucking that up. So he's, he's added the blue of the eyes for you. Um, he married his secretary of the last five years, and her name was Fabi Ravine, and it was her second marriage. There we are. Uh, the stars must have okayed it, as the widow Heindel officiated. It was a troubled union, though, and Faye committed suicide ten years later, leaving him a note that said, Mama, I had to do it. The pain of living is worse than that of dying. Sickness, heartaches, insomnia, forgive me. She'd had various illnesses and was jealous and angry of his popularity and the demands of the lecture circuit. He was basically never at home. She had reason to be annoyed as she'd been part of his stage presence with the turban and the mesmeric uh, mind reading act that they used to do together and so on. And then he switched and became this, you know, this more proper mystic. Um, uh, nor did she get any credit for the significant help she'd given him in completing the secret teachings of all ages. And it's quite probable that the success of that book enabled them to get married in the first place. They'd been quite a glamorous couple about town and much loved by Hollywood royalty. And their best friend was the photographer William Mortensen, who was famous for his portraits of uh, Marlena Dietrich, Fay Ray, Anna Mae Wong and Yasha Heifetz. He photographed uh, for Cecil B. DeMille, whose great gothic modernist style was ideal for black and white images. <coughs> Manley Hall quietly removed all mentions of his poor wife from his extensive archive. 
as I say, she wasn't mentioned in the secret teachings of all ages, she just was excised from his life. She was replaced by Virginia B. Pomeroy, again, photographs barely exist of her, who was his faithful secretary for the next 30 years. Every day she took down his every word, took them home then, and typed up 10 to 14 pages of single space words. Then she would mimeograph them and sell them for a dollar a time. California be carried on being innovative and getting stranger, but some things grew roots and became acceptable and very, uh, uh, very successful in their alternative way. Nicholas Rurick had heard Hall on the radio and was influential enough to push through the idea of the all-seeing eye on the dollar bill. So was the in innovator Kandinsky and Brancusi, who were committed theosophists. So was the inventor Thomas Edison, a theosophist too. Hall decided to set up his own spiritual centre in Los Angeles to counteract the ivy tower materialism of the universities. Its mission would be to teach practical idealism, preserved in the 100,000 texts of antiquity, to develop programmes for the good of society and to excite its pupils to apply the positive thought in daily life. Los Angeles was growing so fast it needed a spiritual rudder and MPH would be its occult theologian. So he bought three quarters of an acre of land for ten dollars and set up his Philosophical Research Society in 1934. Again, he's 33 by now. Um, an English, it, and to build what he wanted to build, he needed an architect. And there was an English amateur archaeologist and explorer who was an, also an, ar an architect, and his name was Robert B. Stacy. Judd, Stacey Judd. And he was so keen on its Egyptian Mayan styling that he chose for the Philosophical Research Centre that he even used to wear feathered Mayan costumes to parties. He invented the Mayan revival style of architecture, wrote a book on Atlantis, and was quite prolific as an artist. Now, I don't know what's next. Oh, that's like the secret teachings of all ages, but not the glorious edition. All right. His main rival was Henry Spencer Lewis's international headquarters of the ancient and mystical Order Rose Crucis, or Amorc, in their Egyptian temples in San Jose. There he had laboratories and a clinic for, alchemi uh, for alchemists to cure everything, from depression to cancer with mind over matter. He invented the Lux Tone colour organ, which converted o audio signals to colours on a triangular screen, which was quite a fad for a while. There was the Cosmic Ray Coincidence Counter, which was a prototype Geiger counter of its day. The sympathetic vibrations harp, which was used to measure sympathetic vibrations. The busy alchemist spent a lot of time and effort trying to m transmute zinc into gold, but decided it wasn't cost effective, so buying elemental gold was more sensible. There were dreamers and businessmen in equal measure, and money was to be made even in the Depression, when everyone needed a hustle, and these alternative thinkers were in the right place at the right time. This is wife number two. Mari Bauer. She was referred to as a high voltage immigrant fashion plate, or perhaps she was just a chic young woman who was in Manley Hall's library researching the 17th century manuscripts that were because she was looking for coded references to a vault she believed Francis Bacon had buried beneath the tower of the Bruton Parish Episcopal Church in Williamsburg, Virginia. This is a church that's 300 years old. She believed that her Lord Bacon had travelled everywhere in the world, whether it was known or unknown at the time, and that he had deposited in a vault there gold chalices and copper cylinders containing lost Shakespeare manuscripts, a plan to end war and to establish a limited brotherhood on earth and the keys to similar sites around the world. Fifty years later she still hadn't found it but she would enlisted the help of all sorts of people who should have known better. Her long-suffering husband was irritated by her infatuation with Manly Hall and used, um, he was a decent man and she was an erratic mother and scored high even on the Californian bonkersometer really. But there were reasons why. She was one of five daughters um, of German immigrants so she'd had to shout to be heard. She'd been gang raped and left bleeding by members of the yacht club where she worked and had become pregnant as a consequence. Her husband helped find an abortion and then they subsequently produced two children. Manley Hall had no children um, in or out of marriage. So she was crazy but 
you know, we, we have to be more sympathetic towards her, I think. Her first dig, if you could call that, was two men in, with shovels being shrilly goaded on by this tiny little woman. And it led to the first ever geophysical survey for an archaeological application. And they found a, a coffin. It was in a graveyard, it's true, but it also showed up where the gravel gave way to the sand and the, and the seashells. So, you know, it showed that the technique they were using worked. She was such an expert at cracking codes that the FBI opened a file on her in World War II and Manly Hall had to say that they were to do with Bacon, not Hitler, as the FBI had suspected. She took up platonically with a rich man who lobbied Congress on her behalf and got a job as an odd job man so that he could access all of the building and would appear from behind pillars to thrust leaflets into the hands of the congressman. They were to do, going to leaflet bomb the whole of the states on Bacon's behalf, but that one didn't actually happen. So she, you know, he, Manly Hall was persuasive and calm and deeply knowledgeable. She was just one of these human whirlwinds, really. And again, strange thing for that man to do. They were both living off rich patrons, Manly Hall, Hall's oil millionairesses, um, and they not only supported him for 38 years, they left him well provided for in their wills. Um, Mari then decided that the house wasn't adequate for the status that they had and the importance of the work they were doing. So he was away lecturing, so she sold the house and bought a bigger one and was really quite miffed with him because he was annoyed with her for doing it. But they were the the celebrity occult couple, really. She was the reincarnation of Pallas Athene, after all. Um, and she used to... Um, flick up, paint her um, eyebrows in to flick up and she wore these snake bangles to prove it and all the rest of it. Um, so in, yeah, in, no, why, yes, in, 19, in June 1954, Jack Parsons blew himself up. He was 31, a rocket scientist and a thalamite. That unfortunate day, he blew up the shed, blew off his right arm, broke the other one and both his legs and blew a huge hole in his jaw. The immediacy of his grie his, her grief caused his mother to commit suicide the same day. The Crowley fans in Pasadena were well aware of Hall and Hall was a reader of Crowley. He described him as a horrible man and a great poet. He kept one of the great, the great beast's books out of reach of his normal library users and he also kept a signed copy of an early 1903 Crowley poem in his top desk drawer. It was one of his rude ones and Hall said he kept it there as a constant reminder of how low the human intellect can go in the cause of art. <laughs> He was raised a mason in that year after decades of writing about Masonic history and law. He rose through the ranks of the Scottish Rite and took little more than a year to reach the 33rd degree. And then because he was oath bound, he never wrote about it again. This is um, him very, you know, he's dominating there. Um, that's the uh, PRS headquarters within the Mayan Egyptian style. Um, Years later, they wanted to expand it um, and uh, or knock it down, move you know knock it down, move, put in a big car park and all the rest of it. By then, the locals were so attached to it, the town council wouldn't let them alter a thing. So they were stuck in this space that, 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 that was smaller than they wanted it to be. This is how it emerged. So uh, California is the home is the home of experimenters in religion, education, science and health. And in 1940s, Manley Hall had his gallbladder removed and had trouble with his back, hands and feet. His thyroid gland was removed as he believed it to be a mediator between the body and the intellect and in control of the pleasing aspects of one's personality. I would have kept mine, I would have had it twinned. Anyway, he became so fat he had to have the driver's seat removed from his car, the pedals and steering wheel extended, and he sat on the back, a box in the back of the car to drive. They were all into alternative healing treatments, and their film star friends were too. Manly and Mari's favourite was Phil at Grey, or Dr A. He used to put his hands up women's blouses or skirts, manipulate their energies, and thus cure them. People like that still exist, ladies and gentlemen. He laid his head upon their chest first until he got the signal. Fortunes were made because it was all down to blocked energies, electricity and radiation. We could all name ten people right now. 
Elimination was another way to health, blood purification, enemas, vitamin shots, Hall's assistant's frequent administering of the water angel treatment in, later in his life was to be part of his eventual undoing. A water angel is river water warmed by the sun and administered from a hollowed out gourd. Quite soon the assistant was overdoing it and the subsequent damage to his rectal tissues and the strain on Hall's heart by throwing out all of his electrolytes was the beginning of his long decline. Someone else that Hall consulted frequently was a man he called the Gaul from Transylvania because he had a thick accent and wired people up to a copper plate with a copper plate in one hand and a nickel plate in the other um, to, and he, to his electro-stimulating machine. This guy, the Ghoul of Transylvania, was also connected with the Mafia. Hall was considered a high priest amongst these healers and you know there were dozens of others then but one, as one of them said to have Hall as a patient meant that you'd arrived and he and Murray tried everything and they thrived and they were very very well known and you know they, they were the go-to couple but it was also a case if you had a party and they turned up then you, you couldn't lose. The late 1950s saw Hall trying to establish the Philosophical Research Society as a degree-granting institution in philosophy, psychology and comparative religions. His Masonic friends in high places proved useful and included the Californian governor and by extension of the Mayan revival extravaganza, to, um, they, they, say they wanted bigger buildings but that all fell flat. Hall took a handful of people under his personal wing each year for fast-tracking tra fast through the mysteries. One of them was Don Ingalls, who credits Hall with his success as a film and television writer. He wrote Have Gun, Will Travel, Bonanza and Fantasy Island, for those of you who may be old enough to remember such things. He was in the police department at the time, and his partner was Eugene Rodenbury, who created Star Trek. A talk on Blavatsky by Hall involving parallel universes became the Star Trek episode. Ingalls believes the popularity of the show stems from the themes of decency, morality and sacrifice for the common good. He says, in a broad sense, my time with Manley helped expand my views of life. His teachings of the great schools of philosophy were very helpful in my creative endeavours. They expanded my capabilities and added a sense of balance, calmness and self-control. Basically, Hall helped me to develop a different personal value system than chasing women and the fast buck, one based on honest labour and poise under pressure. Hall, meanwhile, called television a precocious infant that was exerting an undue influence on the shaping of human conduct. So, by the 1960s, Hall was in decline in popularity. You can see him as the sleek burger that he became, really. He, he was, you know, a backslapper. He was a high mason. He was, you know, a, he was a rich Californian. He knew, he knew it all backwards by this stage. And he was smooth, always. The, there's a lot of his stuff on YouTube. And he... Um, he has quite a soporific voice in some ways, but it's always interesting. He knew how to hold an audience. That's Jack Parsons. That's one of these terrible machines. Uh, that's him as he begins his decline, really, in, in the 50s. But it was in the late 50s, early 60s. He was in decline in popularity and out of sorts with society. He offered gentle systems of thoughtfulness aimed at smoothing out one's eccentricities and inconsistencies. Magic, drugs, lashings of sex, great music and flower powers were more attractive to people. Of LSD, Hall said, there's no proof or evidence of any kind that SD actually results in any legitimate type of ESP. The experiences described are not such that they can be regarded as clairvoyant or true visions in the religious sense of the world. He blamed the media and he then threw a party for Aldous Huxley who advocated mescaline. In 1975, the American Heritage Research Association declared Hall a living monument, an, uh, an important and valuable human resource to the USA living during the closing years of the first bi uh, American bicentennium. He and Mari became fashion conscious and she married him wear flashy shirts and she had breast augmentation and eye bag reductions. They hired a cataloger, new staff were appointed and the future without Manly Hall was addressed. All to no avail, it just didn't get pulled together. Drake died, the new staff spent the money, and enter his nemesis, Daniel Henry Fitz. Fitz was a New Age priest of the Atlantean priesthood of the Independent Church of Antioch. He was an ex-banker and computer marketeer, a renter of isolation tanks, 
and an administrator of colonic irrigations. He wanted to set up an underwater birthing centre of dolphin midwifery. And Mari loved him because he flattered her. He installed himself, his two sons, and to his son, and two nurses for the old couple, and all seemed well. Fritz was the man who never knew when to stop, as it was he who made Manly drink so much carrot juice that he turned orange. It was he who administered the, the uh, water angel that I mentioned earlier. The old couple were given herbal injections and chanted over to get them to sleep, all at a cost, but they lost control of how much he was paying himself as Fitz con took control of the checkbook. He sold some gold coins and the dealer recognised them as belonging to Hall. When he spoke with Hall about the theft, he was told that they depended on Fritz and had no power to resist him, so please say nothing if it happened again. Hall had fear in his eyes and the mood at the PRS changed to one of unhappiness for the staff as they too believed that Fritz menaced them with black magic. Someone said it was like ageing velvet, a grand fabric coming apart. Hall stayed strong and devoted to his metaphysics. His last public appearance was in Wilshire Boulevard in uh, May 1990. The 21st century has an extreme reminiscence of the 20th year, 21st year in a person's life. It's the year of coming of age when a person becomes an adult. In the 21st century, the United States must take on the responsibilities and labours for its own maturity at a time when natural resources are being squandered, politicians have corrupted, being corrupted by power and greed, crime was spiralling out of control, education was failing children, and war was persisting worldwide. Mankind, he said, has not the right to take a beautiful world with all its privileges and opportunities and turn it into a purgatory. This situation should remind Freemasons that they have something to live for. We have the power to build worlds, the wisdom to govern them, and the divine right to inherit the earth and preserve it in good condition in order to pass it on to our descendants as a place of happiness, of usefulness and security for thousands of years to come. We are not asking for treason, we are not asking for disobedience, we are only asking that in every way possible, when they have the choices, they stand for truth and if necessary, take a little punishment for it. How unlike evil Fritz. Um, things came to a head when Fritz drove Manly and Mari out to their mobile home and faked a stall engine. He said Mari should go home and he would bring her husband back later. She refused to go without her sick Manly and so when he tried to start the engine it started at once and they went home again. And the next day they did the same thing. They set out on a journey, the car broke down and this time Mari left. And that was the last time that she saw Manly Hall alive. Later, he was being seen being carried ashen-faced and unresponsive into the house by a neighbour. Fritz said that he thought his soul and Manley's were merging and he was the luckiest man on the planet. A little while later, he rang the doctor to say Hall was dead. Then a little while later, he rang again to say, oh no, sorry, he isn't. And then later to say, yes, he is now, he's really, really dead this time. Um, Fritz didn't tell anyone of the death for three days. He said because of all his, uh, of Hall's religious beliefs. In actual fact, it was because he was looting the place. A thousand people attended the Masonic funeral um, for Manly Hall, uh, although they forgot to dress the corpse in his Masonic apron. And uh, a week later, Dan Fritz told the PRS board that a trust had been set up just six days before the death, and they all had him to answer for now. The day Hall died, the doctor examined Hall and noticed that he was lying on a bed without a wrinkle on it. Thousands of ants were pouring from his throat, nose, mouth and ears. The body had been dead for at least eight hours because it was stone cold. Cleaners were trying to remove move what looked like bloodstains from the carpet and armfuls of clothes were being removed by Fritz's son, who also took the stamp collections which he was a very, very keen philatelist, philatelist all his life, and he had remarkable stuff. Dr Pollock rescinded the death certificate he'd signed two hours before that stated that Hall had died of acute myocardial infarction, or a heart attack, which was attributed to natural causes. $2.3 million in cash and a treasure trove of antiques and artefacts and rare books went missing. Hall's house and the PRS worth, properties worth millions were now... In, the, in danger of getting away from Fritz without the death certificate. He demanded an instant cremation. 
The family refused that and had the body taken to Forest Lawn Cemetery for three months while they tried to gather evidence of murder. The post-mortem was so flawed that it stated he still had his gallbladder and thyroid gland, both of, both of which had been removed in the 1940s. The coroner was the one who was involved in the O.J. Simpson case and was badly discredited very publicly because of that. The family's autopsy showed traces of soil around Hall's eyes, mouth and nose, a bruise to his face, another to his neck, and recent trauma to his, bra trauma to his back and legs. There were also small needle marks of the skin and mucosal surfaces of various bodily orifices. The conclusion was that Hall had died from asphyxiation from smothering or from manual strangulation and had been outdoors lying in the dirt at the time of his death. The sort of ants proved that he was outside at the time of the death. There were one of the millions that had come out of him. Five times the police went to the Los Angeles district attorney and each time they were told to get more evidence. The forgery squad were obviously involved as well. Mari and her children battled on for four years and then they settled with Fritz for 1.9 million in cash. Some books on alchemy were also returned and later sold to the Getty Museum for three quarters of a million dollars. No mention was made of the manuscript on vellum explaining intricate diagrams drawn from the Kabbalah that he had loved having. Hall also owned a 12th century bishop's ring that Rudolf Valentino had worn in his film The Son of the Sheikh. In June 1995, nearly five years after his death, um, Manly Prentice Hall was finally cremated. That's the grand old man. And that's Fritz with him there. This, the, um, they tried to bury him once, but the ground was so waterlogged they had to take the... Um, coffin back to where they, it had been stored. The, the, the ending of the hall was just such a muddle. It was really quite remarkable. Um, and say so he was finally buried five years later. Mari Bauer Hall died on the 21st of April 2005, aged 100. Daniel Fritz died a horrible death in 1901, having suffered with adrenal cancer, which is extraordinarily rare, and bladder cancer. He had been running a Pythagorean school for virgin mothers and selling oracle medicines. That is the book that I took most of that from. Thank you very much. <laughs>